This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square, and we are virtual again. We are virtual. Aren't we? Are we uh, we're always virtual anymore. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're glad you're with us. My name is Rob Henderson, and I'm the priest at Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London, Ontario. Better man you won't find. I can tell you that right now. And that guy, Rob Henderson, he's a great guy. I'm I'm Kevin George. I'm a vicar vicar number two of, of thing one and thing two. I'm at uh, St. Aidan's Anglican Church up in the northwest corner of London, and I am all about the retro uh, reverse retro abs today. So that's you know, a sweet jersey. That's a nice looking sweater right there. Over to the other guy. And my name is Ian. I'm a singer songwriter. And if you're thing one and thing two, then can I be the cat in the hat? Yes, you, you can. can. Sweet. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I even I'm, have a hat for you if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just we like have we props. It, boys. Yeah, yeah. Just like we rehearsed it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, that's great. It was good to see you guys again. And uh, today we're welcoming uh, two folks from our community here in London whose uh, commitment to the most vulnerable in our um, city is second to none. We're going to be talking to uh, Gil Cleland and Sarah Campbell, who will be with us in a bit, and they've got a great story to tell about what happens when communities and uh, people of goodwill and good faith come together to address the needs of those that need them most. And uh, so we're going to find out more about that coming up in just a bit. Right. And before we do, um, I'm just noticing in our notes, guys, we do some show notes. But if you could see my show notes as I typed them up, it's supposed to say the most vulnerable in our city. And it says the vulnerable in our vacuity. <laughs> that's I just funny. thought that was a word that I didn't know. The no, meaning no, of, so it's just, just that's over. just the way I type, man. Um, <laughs> anyway, we want to acknowledge that uh, the lamb we are upon is sacred. The Vickers Crossing acknowledges that our podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anunnakiabek. Haudenosaunee, the Lenawepak, uh, pardon me, Lene Paywalk, and the Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish of One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to a diverse and indigenous uh, peoples uh, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this land, and we commit to working together to do what we can to bring about reconciliation between all our peoples. Very good. And uh, we want to, as always, thank our sponsors who make all this possible for us here in the Vickers Crossing. We've got three great sponsors, uh, A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, sex, both family owned and operated. And our thanks to Dave Mullen and the staff there for their support of our podcast. The Mullinator, the good old Mullinator. Mullinator. Got to thank yeah. them. Thank the Mullinator. And um, I, I give a shout out to, I normally shout out to is Carol Basada up at Hyde Park Care Pharmacy up at uh, Hyde Park Road up here, uh, Hyde Park in Sarnia, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, you should get all your drug needs, uh, get up there and get your drugs, get your band-aids and, you know, your uh, witch hazel and, uh, you know, whatever else, else you need, like if you need some, I don't know. Um, Kaopectate? Kaopectate. And what's the one you put on the uh, chicken pox? Uh, Calamine lotion. Get some calamine. calamine. Go over there and get some oh, yeah. Go on over and like see. a Saturday night and some calamine lotion. <laughs> you get a weekend. You get over to Carol Basada and you tell her Kevin George sent you over looking for some calamine lotion because you want to lather up <laughs> in calamine lotion. 
<laughs> and last but certainly not least, we want to say a very special thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. When you're like buttered up in that calamine lotion and it's all over the carpet, you know who to call. Uh, yes, I want to say a right. huge thank you to Trisha Lister for that. <laughs> She'll get that caked off calamine yeah. lotion off, oh, the, off the shaggy carpet. As a matter of fact, I think there's a 40% <laughs> discount for calamine lotion removal this week at Molly Maid. Uh, so Molly Maid. call <laughs> and uh, find out more about that. Group. Yeah, Vickers That's Crossing special. special. What a week. Yeah. <laughs> what a week. What a week. Well, let's just check in quick uh, with everybody. It's been a week and a half for some of us, yes. many of us, uh, <laughs> yeah. as we continue here in this pandemic time. So how are you guys holding up? Well, you know, What's Robbie, on? you know, Robbie, what I was thinking is it will be really nice if this pandemic thing was over. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got it marked on my, I got a reminder on my phone. Pandemic okay. over. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm ready. I'm done with this. It's not done with us, but I'm done with this. So I, I'm trying to remain patient and optimistic, but my gosh, it's getting hard. Uh, yeah. That's just my reflection on that this week. I, I, I uh, you know, it's tedious. It is. It's and tiresome it's too. It's, yeah. yeah, it's getting old. It's, yeah. yeah. And how's school going, Ian? You okay it's, with uh, it? Yeah, it's, it's going, you know, like, like Kevin said, the, the pandemic is just like, just not, having a good time with anything schools are mm. you know all mostly online and and um like i i only went to the studio once and that was two days ago I, that was the first time i went to the studio um and i it was late at night and like we had to be masked up and everything it was it's a hassle and uh i'm i'm staying you know inside because i'm a i'm a good boy um a good boy. but but it's it's really tiring and and who's a good boy <laughs> who's a good boy i'll go for a walk <laughs> <laughs> no you're absolutely right it's exhausting i think yeah. we've for many of us we've hit walls and yeah. um and but you know i get it when i go to the grocery store and people are just grumpy yeah it's like dude grump all you want i get it yeah, yeah. i'm sorry that i have to i have to reach around you get the bread you know but you're not moving your cart and if you want to give me a dirty look, that's fine. But yeah. I need my bread. Let's get on with it. <laughs> right. right. And uh, it's just, you get that sense. That's the, that's kind of the feel in the air. And it's frustrating because there's nothing like we can really do to fix it other than wait. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, we just wait, wait, wait you to know, move. We're, we're not that far off. It's just, uh, boy, I agree with, with, with you two guys. It's, it's a tedious thing. Like you say, I don't go into the grocery store that often because I don't want to, I don't want to pull a jersey up over a guy's head and get into a fist fight over a loaf of bread and all <laughs> that. that. I just, yeah. I don't want it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but if we, if we three, uh, if we three fools can bring a little levity into your day right now, that's what we're all about. Victor, with Victor, then, then we, why don't we try to do that and have a little fun? Okay. Hey. So let's put some smiles on some faces and uh, make fun of each other as we play the new game here on the Vickers Crossing, which we like to call. It's not a lie. If you believe it. Huh. Greater truth has never been spoken. What what is this, Rob? What is this segment this, you speak of? Well, as as you know, um, we have some stories to tell sometimes yes. between the three of us. Yep. So we thought we would air those stories on the podcast yep. and uh, force each of us. I think in some way, uh, we like to tell stories that could be lies. Could be. And again, they may not be because no. we believe them. If you believe them. So if you believe it, it's not really a lie. Okay. So this week it's my turn and I'm yeah. going to tell a story about yeah. myself yeah. and um, it may be a lie, but because I believe it, it may be true. You guys got to figure out if it's, if it's a lie or not. Okay. 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 So here's my story today. I was once asked by the police to be in a police lineup. <laughs> 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 cops this yep, feels like cops. another episode of seinfeld actually wasn't kramer Maybe, yeah. yeah they were at the end there wasn't there yeah <laughs> uh they uh, a couple of times i think they were in a police lineup yeah but yeah i was the cops came and took me and put me in a police lineup okay am i allowed to ask questions you can yeah you can each ask one question i think okay fine. i, I want to sure. ask a question were these the chatham police the windsor police or the london police or the sarnia police Windsor police. Officers. Okay. The Windsor, Windsor police officers. Okay. Did they just find you at your house or like, where did they, where did they ask you? Did they call you in? Did they, uh, I was in a, I was in a restaurant and they approached me. 
All right. This is very good. This is very good. The plot thickens. So so let me get this straight. Now I'm going to choose if this is a lie or not. But if but if you believe it, it's not a lie. Yeah. Right. If I believe it, I've been telling this story to everybody for years because it's okay. true. Right. Okay. If I believe it. So I'm, I'm going to say it. that in conventional wisdom, we will call this a lie. It may not be because you believe it, but I'm going to say that if we were looking at the real truth of the thing, this thing is a lie. That's what I'm going to say. Mm. Okay. okay. I think I agree with Kevin. I think actually, no, you know what? I'm going to change my mind. I think you were asked, but I don't think that you went to go be in the lineup. I think they came up to you in the restaurant. They were like, uh, I'm a police officer, sir. Can you be in a police lineup? And you said no, because uh, you had uh, to do pre- something previous, that day. Previous criminal record? Or, or I, had a, uh, I had a baptism that day. <laughs> yeah, you had something got, going I on. I had a baptism, but I can't be doing Yeah, this. I can't do, no, I can't That's do that. Right. I, think, I think it is true. So Kevin says it's a lie. Ian says it's kind of a half lie because it yeah. might have happened, right. but there's no way I would have done it. Yeah. yeah. Right. But let's remember well, it's not a lie if you believe it. If, you if believe I believe it. it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't have to believe it because it's the God's honest truth. My hand to God. Honest to God. This happened to me. <laughs> yeah. And the story is I got to yeah. go back a bit. I'm about 15 years old. Yeah. And Kevin, you'll be able to <laughs> picture this because you lived 15? in Windsor. Yeah. I'm yeah. 15 years old. I'm sitting in the McDonald's restaurant in downtown Windsor, right across from oh, yeah. the tunnel entrances. You know that? Yeah, fine the area. Station's about two blocks down from there. That's right. So me and some guys are sitting in McDonald's one Friday night at seven or eight o'clock, eating our Big Macs, and these two guys in suits walk up and say, "Hey, you guys want to make twenty bucks?" And we're like, <laughs> "They paid sure. you." You know, I don't. And they said, "Come with us. We need you to line up." So we walked down to the police station <laughs> and stood in a room with about six or seven other teenagers of course being a teenager we're not thinking anything like well what if they know, pick me the murder in the room with us that's yeah. that never crossed our <laughs> yeah, mind yeah, yeah. or what if they pick me <laughs> like that never crossed our all we knew was hey we're getting 20 bucks 20 bucks <laughs> so we stood in this room for a few minutes and the doors open and the guy said yeah just go out there and stand and stare at the glass and out we went and we stared at the glass for about 30 seconds and the guy said, okay. And then we walked out and the guy gave us 20 bucks and we went back to McDonald's. <laughs> Did you hold up God. a sign? <laughs> Did you, were you holding no, up a sign? stood like, there. Every, stood ah. there and looked now, like a dopey 14, 15 year old. Now, did they ask, did they ask you, did, did everybody have to step forward and say, don't say a word? <laughs> no, we didn't have any lines or anything no, i love it but I that's love it. what happened to me that was my story from the okay clouds. so i, I was know. wrong on this one so wow. I, it's it's not a lie if you believe it if you believe it right. it's not a lie wow. if you believe it so wow uh, anyway had some fun with that and uh, we'll do another one next week i think no. it's kevin's turn no no, no i think it's no, ian next week next week, well, yeah. next week. week. hey and mm-hmm. you know what uh, we've been doing here throughout february this is uh, black history month and uh, we've been highlighting on the show each week. Um, uh, we've been uh, holding up another sort of uh, uh, Canadian hero, black Canadian hero, and uh, asking our guests about that as well. And um, last week I had a, I had a, a chat about uh, uh, um, our friend uh, Lincoln Alexander. And uh, this week it's over to Robbie, the guy who talks whether it's a lie or not a lie, uh, right. has, has uh, somebody he'd like to highlight this week. Somebody I'd like to highlight because I met this gentleman uh, some years back. And, you know, you, they say, and maybe you guys have experienced this, if you meet your, your heroes or the people that you look up to, sometimes it can be a disappointment, you know, like you yeah. have them in such a light that, yes. and then when you actually meet them, it's, you kind of walk away, oh my gosh. Yeah. But this gentleman could not have been more gracious and kind and patient when I met him. And I want to highlight today, uh, Black History Month, a great athlete. Um, in, in Canada that everybody knows, Ferguson Arthur Jenkins, uh, known as Fergie. Fergie, Fergie Jenkins. Yeah. So Fergie Legend. was born um, in uh, Chatham, Ontario, in uh, 1942, December 13th, born and raised in Chatham, the only child of Dolores and uh, Ferguson Jr. His father was a chef and a chauffeur, and uh, they were originally from Barbados. They're immigrants from Barbados. His mom was a descendant of slaves who escaped through the Underground Railroad uh, before settling in southwest Ontario. So they had those connections as well through the family. Uh, both of his parents, great athletes. His father was an amateur boxer and semi-pro baseball player for the Chatham Colored All-Stars back mm. in the day. 
And so in 1962, Fergie Jenkins was signed by the Philadelphia Phillies, and he made his Major League debut in 1965 as a relief pitcher. And then he was later traded to the team that most known from, which is the Chicago Cubs, where he'd go Cubs, on to become baby. one of the best, best pitchers in Major League Baseball, um, becoming the first Canadian ever elected to baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. He's in the Canadian Hall of Fame, too. And he played some baseball in Canada after a while. I actually pitched a couple of seasons for, do you know this, a local team that you might've heard of here in London? Uh, the uh, London Majors? The London uh, Majors, yeah. Oh, Fergie yeah, yeah. pitched for the London Majors. I didn't know that. Uh, back in the early 80s. And uh, he um, also took a shot at politics. You might remember he ran for the Liberal Party as an MP in Windsor Riverside in the mid-1980s as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, did not wanted to win that election but he also spent a short time as the sports director at cozy 95 radio which is where i met fergie when i first arrived in chatham and i had a very limited time with him but as i say very gracious guy kind would would sit around and tell us stories um and Fantastic. answer our silly questions and and yeah. do all that so just a great uh, and you know of course chatham loves him and canada yeah. loves him and um, a, a great, uh, not only athlete, but uh, really helped help his city out a lot, a lot of inner city kids and did a lot of work locally that a lot of people don't even know about. Um, but anyway, he lives in Arizona right now. And so I was thinking of Fergie Jenkins uh, yeah, this, just this week and this month. Think about That's fantastic, Rob. Thanks. I, I just yes. think about the number of kids who, uh, you know, like our generation, especially like we sort of, and, and, uh, and uh, kids a bit older than us too, that sort of grew up with Fergie as a, as a role model, right? And I think for uh, for uh, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color uh, to have somebody locally here in southwestern Ontario make it, so to speak, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of that big league stuff, must have been a big deal too. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard and, those and stories. You'd come that home, was... You know, you'd come home and uh, at certain times of the year when there were parades and things like that, and people, yeah, would gather around him and he would sign every autograph and talk to every person. And... Fantastic. Just yeah, really a good guy, and uh, and yeah. I was honored to to meet him for a short time there too. So, fantastic. Um, anyway, well, that's who was on my mind. Well, you know who you know who we need to find out is who our guests Gil and Sarah, who they might uh, hold up a little later in the show. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll ask them too. Perfect. So why don't we ask them because they're here and they're coming into the Vickers Crossing Zoom room. So let's bring in Gil and Sarah. And here they are, our latest guests here on the Vickers Crossing podcast. We want to welcome in Gil Clellan and Sarah Campbell to the podcast today. How are you guys? Hey, really glad Good. to be here. Yeah, Great. Well, we're thanks for having us. This is an amazing uh, opportunity. Thanks so much. You're welcome. No, we're thrilled that you're here. We're thrilled that um, we have some folks from London because, uh, you know, we started our podcast. It was all local because we were kind of meeting together in a room and recording. And in since the pandemic hit... We've been going more doing it this way, which meant that we were bringing in people we couldn't bring in before because they were far away. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to, to do some things uh, here from London but, and, and hear about what you're doing, which we're going to get into in more detail coming up. So, um, so Gil, how are you making out with, with everything in this pandemic right now? Are you kind of you're stuck at the office like all of us stuck at home? I'm not at the office. Actually, this is a, a rare occasion that I'm actually in my office for a, a couple of hours right now. Uh, most of the time I'm out doing something. Uh, I've got lots of plates up in the air. Uh, we're running a church called Sanctuary, which is part of the downtown uh, area, um, doing outreach for Sanctuary and then uh, um, being part of WISH as well. So there's lots of plates in the air. So, but it's always busy. Feeling yep. good though. Yep. Good, good, good. How about you, Sarah? How are you holding up with everything? Well, it's been uh, not a quiet pandemic for the Arcade Street Ministries. Um, here we're doing all sorts of uh, different ways of serving our friends uh, on the streets, uh, our friends who are living rather marginalized during this pandemic. A lot of people feeling lonely, a lot of people looking for connection. Uh, while we're being told to stay safe at home, people mm -hmm. are feeling so disconnected from their communities. And so... Yeah. Uh, beyond the basic needs that the ARC is kind of known for uh, delivering, um, we're really missing that sense of community uh, that that really characterizes the way that we work with folks. Yeah, right. yeah, very much so. And thanks be to God, you folks are out there doing this work. It's uh, so incredibly important. We're going to find out a lot more about it in our next uh, 
45 minutes or so together. So Kevin, would you just give more of an introduction for yeah. to our listeners uh, about what these folks do a little bit more? Yeah. So those of you out there, those of you who are in London will know who these people are because I can't think of two people who are working harder right now to uh, uh, to work with the marginalized and, and the uh, communities who are very vulnerable here in the city. You two are, are rock stars when it comes to that. And I, I thank you for it. Uh, but for those of you who are listening outside the area, you may not know them as well. I don't know. I mean, they could be rock stars for all I know outside this area, but I, you may not know who they are. So let me tell you a little bit. Sarah Campbell loves people, which is good because you're here with people right now. Well, we think we're people anyway. Uh, as she says, it's a good thing uh, because uh, she's the daughter of a Pentecostal pastor with four siblings. She's a mother to four children, a community connector. The woman shares life, faith, and love through integrated and wholehearted approach to leadership and community with which she's carrying out right now at the uh, ARC. Sarah has been working in social services for over 20 years and is the new, brand new, shiny executive director at the Arcade Street Mission, where through a desire to be and see Jesus in the world and people around her, the organization is centering services and ministry on the sharing of love and hope in practical ways. And she's joined today with us uh, by Gil. Uh, Gil Cleland uh, is the pastor of a church called Sanctuary in London. Uh, Sanctuary's mandate is to welcome all people and to make home together, especially perhaps the most disenfranchised and poor among us. Once a high school teacher, a funeral director, and a part-time contractor, I got to stop here. Gil, this sounds like a, a made-for-TV reality show, I'm telling you. So you got, you, got your, uh, you got your high school teacher, your funeral director, and your part-time contractor, and a pastor walk into a bar. No, and he's been, <laughs> he's been, he's been a pastor um, for uh, 14 years in London, and he's married to Bonnie. They have three sons, Joseph, Isaiah, and Jacob. He loves, I just love how Gil and I have so much in common. He loves running, rock climbing, enjoying a coffee or a craft beer with friends and finds time to be an artist. I love craft beer too. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have a lot in common. The running and the rock climbing, eh, but <laughs> I'll tell you, in the summer, you will find chalk art uh, that Gil is doing on sidewalks, which is absolutely incredible I, I happen to be on the board at jesse's journey and when we had the walk this year which was held virtually like so much else um gil came out and did a piece for us uh of jesse uh the many people who are not in the area might not know jesse davidson was a kid with uh, um uh, who had duchenne muscular dystrophy and his dad uh john pushed him all over ontario 3400 kilometers and then two years later walked across canada and since his organization has raised uh, given over $10 million to research. So this walk every year takes place. And, and what does Gil do? He comes out and he, in chalk art, does this beautiful mural of Jesse. Incredible. So thank you for all you do with that too, Gil. Yeah, it was a, it was a really uh, good time. I just, I just picked up uh, chalk art this past year because of the pandemic. I wanted to get out of my house. And so I just went out to my driveway and started drawing. Oh, wow. And, uh, I thought you'd been at it for years. Picked up some momentum. Out. Yeah. yeah well, fantastic. Okay, well, listen, a lot of our listeners are outside the London area, at least according to the interweave stuff that I look at. Um, you're both involved with incredible ministries that are making a difference uh, here. Um, let, let's begin with you, Sarah. Can you tell our listeners about Arcade Mission and the work that's being done there and that you do there? And Gil, when she's done, you can tell us a bit about Sanctuary. Certainly. So Arcade Mission has existed here in London for uh, over 30 years. It started as an arcade, not arcade, arcade. like an arcade. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see and what it, you did there. That's how it happened. So it was an arcade and it was sort of a youth uh, center originally, and it became Arcade Street Mission. And so we uh, provide community and largely has been known as a, sort of a soup kitchen place. You know, people come get dinner here. Uh, and have community in the evenings. And uh, since I started back in May, nothing has been normal. Uh, of course, we know the pandemic has changed just about every way that we connect with people. Uh, and on top of that, the need in our community, particularly in the marginalized community during this pandemic has been, I think, unprecedented. And so um, I feel so blessed that I've been able to sort of bring my many years of experience in the social service sector into this ministry space and sort of integrating sort of my, my personal faith journey and walk with uh, the work that I've been doing passionately 
uh, mm -hmm. as what I've believed has been my calling for a long time. And so here at the ARC, we've kind of um, just added and added different ways to serve folks. Uh, in the summer, it started with something called ARC Shade. Mm. Arc aid, arc shade. Yeah, and you guys in the words. You guys in the use of words. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. We put some tents outside and and put some misting hoses up and let people cool off because of course we mm. still weren't letting people inside that much in the summer. And here in the winter, we knew that uh, if if it was still going to be difficult to let people inside, we needed to come up with something. And that's uh, where the beginning of WISH, the Winter Interim Solution to Homelessness came from, a call out to friends and, and neighbors, uh, other community organizations to say, hey, is there something we can do together that we can't do separately? Uh, and as so many times is the case that one plus one equals three. And as we came together, we were able to come up with ways that we could serve our, our very marginalized homeless community uh, in ways that would ensure survival this winter and that's how we ended up with our pop-up shelter uh, program that is supported by these 18 organizations. Uh, really, there's sort of nine that have really done the, the lion's share of the, the heavy lifting on this project, but we couldn't do it without the support of all of the folks. Uh, and that's the organizations, but also our donors and the community at large that's donated uh, and given clothing and, and in-kind items. Like we've really had an outpouring of support We've also been doing outreach, like what, what uh, Gil will talk about probably. He's been working with Johnny, who's our outreach worker, and connecting with people out on the streets. And it's been the leveraging of those relationships with people who are out on the streets that's really helped bring people into the WISH shelters. And so what we see is that together we're so much stronger, so much more able to meet the needs of folks. We're able to, to reach more places and, and do things that... Um, you know, intuitively seem impossible. You know, Arcade is an organization that started with three staff when I got here. And uh, between December and January, because of this WISH project, we've hired 80 staff <laughs> mm. <laughs> to make oh, sure that wow. we can staff wow. two places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not really possible in the natural. No. It's only possible in the supernatural. And, and it's because I really believe God loves and cares for these folks that we're serving and he makes a way where there seems to be no way. And so it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, we also have just uh, been working on a laundry and shower program here. So it's been one thing after another, after another, uh, mm. adding to the ways that we can serve our community. Over to wow, Gil. how do you follow that? Yeah, Gil, uh, come on, man. Gil, yeah, come on. What up do you your do, Gil? game, man. Like yeah. Sarah's been busy. You're sitting around drinking craft beer, waiting for the That's next rock, waiting for the next I rock climb to come. Driveway drawing with craft beer. Away I go. Yeah. Loving uh, on I, all the people. Come on. Uh, okay, I, I came to London 14 years ago, answering an ad in the uh, in the paper, uh, looking for a youth director. Uh, for Streetlight Ministries, which is part of Youth for Christ. Hmm. Uh, so I started by driving the bus. I don't know if you guys know about this. It was a bus at the time that went downtown. It was uh, an old Detroit diesel uh, double clutch uh, nice. bus, which I had, to, I had to learn how to drive. <laughs> and we would bring it downtown and, and hang out with uh, street-involved youth and, and get to know them and build relationships with them. And we thought that was kind of what we were supposed to be doing. Uh, hand out a, a sandwich, build a relationship or two, and uh, away you go. Um, during that time, though, the, the community started to grow. Uh, we started to share some, some scripture along the way. We started to share some worship along the way. And the community asked that we weren't a parachurch anymore. We were working for a parachurch organization. And the idea behind a parachurch, as, as my executive director once told me, is to bring people to the church the way a uh, the, the paramedic brings a person to the medic. Um, and the, the idea then is we would bring the people to the church. They would experience some sort of spiritual something with us and we would take them to church. Uh, we found out there's not many churches that are ready for homeless folks. Um, just, <laughs> I just got to let you know uh, yeah. that it, it was a very uncomfortable feeling to sit with uh, my friends in churches on Sunday mornings. It was, it, it, felt odd it felt nasty and i'm not them i right. i actually fit in and i was just sitting with them and it, it it was painful 
So uh, there was a lot of asking saying, can we, can we have church? Can we have something more than, than this, what we have right now? So at that point, uh, my coworker at, at Streetlight, Daryl Reckman and I planted Sanctuary London Ministries. So we started that 10 years ago uh, from nothing. It was, uh, yeah, it was rental space. Our, our office was the coffee shops in the downtown area. <laughs> And we had a rental space here at Talbot Street Church, and that was it. And then we just started building, and uh, the community came and, and came around us, and we've been supported for uh, 10 years, mostly from outside of our, our community, because for some reason, people don't tie their OW check to us. <laughs> and, and that's obviously a joke. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And, and it's been supported for 10 years. And now we have uh, five of us on staff and it, it feels amazing. Uh, but we also feel like this is a, a, a really ripe time in the city of London uh, for growth and expansion of what, uh, how we can impact those who are on the margins of society. Yeah. Um, the, the pandemic has brought this to the forefront that, yeah. that there is injustice, which has been hiding in the corners yeah. for my entire time and long before I got here. And we, you know, you try to raise awareness as much as possible, but it, it, it was hard to raise that type of awareness. And now people are getting it. People mm -hmm. are starting to understand this is an injustice that needs to be fixed. Right. And there is, uh, there is community uh, excitement behind trying to work on it. There are, are, are funders and donors coming out of the woodwork, which is just really exciting. And there's a political will in London. Uh, we just had the mayor visit our, our wish site this past mm -hmm. week. And it was, it was, he said in the paper, he's going to work towards something. And so that's who, to us is it's, it's a ripe time and it's an exciting time uh, for what we're up to right now. Well, it's fantastic. And I, it, it, two things popped to mind as you mentioned sanctuary, what, co there's, <laughs> what comes to mind is the last time we were in there, we went to a, uh, Nadia uh, Najwa Zebian was a, a guest on the podcast, and myself and Catherine and my wife and Robin Margie, we went to a reading of her uh, uh, poetry there, and we got uh, d uh, dive bombed by bats in the, in the performance. <laughs> it was incredible, <laughs> but but I'll tell you that, that that's my joking thing, sort of like the tie thing. But the real powerful thing was being down there when uh, when I when one of uh, London's well known. Uh, downtown uh, characters Benjamin was was killed and and uh, you held this funeral or a memorial for him uh, there and it was really powerful and profound um, and uh, I really just I really appreciate what you're doing at Sanctuary. Um, Sarah shared a bit about um, Wish and, and you've mentioned it as well. For those who are not here in London I'm very excited to hear about uh, Ed's trip there by the way and I, I've been really impressed by uh, our mayor and what he's gotten involved in uh, more than I would have expected uh, a, a, a few years ago, to be honest. Uh, but I've been really uh, pleasantly surprised. Ed is a good heart and a good soul, and uh, he really cares. And I'm, I'm so pleased to see the political wellness there and pleased to see, as Sarah said, how much more we can do when we come together. So I wonder if you guys can share a little bit more about, um, you know, how you how this came together as sarah said you had 19 organizations nine primarily sort of doers to come up with the wish for folks who are unfamiliar is the winter interim solution for homelessness and uh tell us about how it came about what's transpired uh uh and now that both sites are up and running how is it going and, and you know what maybe a, a story or two about um you know what you're seeing that's uh that god is breaking open there yeah, I can I can start on this one because it, it, it's uh, it starts with the outreach and it yeah. starts with with meeting people outside. And so, as, as Sarah mentioned, um, Johnny and I, Johnny works at the Ark and I and, I, and, and a, a bunch of other outreach workers have recently uh, formed an organization called the Outreach Workers of London. And what we do is we get together uh, once a month to kind of compare notes and, and see how it's going out there. And we would go down to Wellington Valley, we'd go to where the people are at and just chat with them, hang out with them. And we wouldn't have a, a timeline on our visits. We, we just wanted to get to know the people as people. And uh, a few months ago, um, we'd go down to Wellington Valley and people were kind of in this adventurous, almost survival mentality. We've got this, we're gonna do it. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna plow our way through and, and we've got this for sure. 
Uh, but as winter started and that the nights got colder, even the strongest among them were starting to say to us, we need something, can we do something? And it was around that time that Sarah got uh, nine of us together at the Arcade Mission. And it was nine of us representing nine different organizations at that point. And we started asking the question, what is the least we want to accomplish this Chris, uh, uh, you know, this winter? Yeah. What is the least that we could do? And we, we used the word survival. And then we started using the word thriving. Yeah. We said, it's, it's not enough just to get people inside and out of the cold. We want some sort of community, some sort of uh, multifaceted response for people. It wasn't just going to be that they were going to be out of the cold. We weren't just going to try to blob everybody in a bunch of open spaces and hope that they, they, they had a heartbeat by April 30th. We said, we need to find a way that this will actually lead to a better life. Yeah. And maybe you want to take it from there, Sarah, because uh, that's a bit of an intro for you. That's a great intro. And I think what's, what's important to know is that this all started, this conversation and what the organization started on November 4th. Mm. As and you tell can people, imagine, and, and tell people who are listening who are not from here what the Wellington Valley look like. Oh yeah. Okay, so Bill, you tell that. Yeah, Wellington Valley is is uh, down by the river, uh, the Thames River in London, and there is probably eight to ten different sites down there where people were were tenting out in, uh, um, outside. And so it was a buildup of tents. It was a buildup of, of uh, just a response to just trying to stay warm. And uh, yeah, a lot of the local agencies would go down there. There was at uh, the high point, probably about 25 people living down in that area. And the, the good news, I guess, is uh, Wellington Valley does not exist as a homeless encampment anymore because right. each one of those people is now inside at the wish site. Right. So. Par pardon the interruption, Sarah. I just I oh, cognizant that the uh, outside London people wouldn't necessarily know what the Wellington Valley is. But. It's important to it's an important thing to know. And so, you know, from those outreach workers going out and really hearing directly the concerns and and additional to that, once we met as a group, like I said, the first meeting being November 4th, where we agreed, yeah, we probably can do something right. Like we could put something together. Uh, we worked. We, we set aside a half day every week uh, from the beginning of November to make a plan. We wrote up a recommendation and sent it to the city. And it came out in a report in front of city council by the 4th of December, actually. So one month from wow. we can probably do something to recommendation to city council. And wow. during that time, we'd have our meeting. And then Johnny and Gil and other outreach <laughs> folks would go out and, and ask our friends, what do you, would this work? What do you think about that? And so the, the solution really started to be formed by the people who were outside. We wanted to understand what do you need to be able to come in? Because clearly the current uh, support systems that existed in the city were not uh, welcoming or, or didn't have the resources or weren't set up in a way that, that folks wanted to go to. So we wanted to understand what did people need? And it was really fascinating uh, what those things were. We need a lock on our door. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to bring our belongings with us. Mm -hmm. If I have a pet, my pet needs to be able to stay with me. If I have a partner, my partner needs to be able to stay with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to come and go as I see fit. I don't want to feel like I'm in jail. I don't want to mm -hmm. feel like I'm being restricted. I'm an adult. I want, I want autonomy. I want to be the expert in my own life. Um, and I think that this really begins to actually paint pictures for us of how we, one, let the people uh, who are the service recipients, so normally they're sort of, you get what you get, Yeah. they are actually designing the service. So this is one example of sort of that upside down, you know, world of kingdom values. Yeah, it's, the, mag the, it's, the, mag it's the Magnificat in action. Exactly. So we start with we ask the people, we enact what the people want, we amplify the voice of the people into a city report that says, this is the winter solution. As though we're so smart, no. no. Yeah. The folks who, yeah. who uh, yeah. need it are so intelligent that they can tell us what they need. And so I think that truly from the very beginning, because we incorporated these kingdom life-giving values into the 
process of how we designed what, what was to come, that that has really added a dimension of spiritual strength mm -hmm. to this effort. And, you know, we didn't put that in our city report. You might be surprised. There was well, no well, lines well, about they're that. Not, they're not into that or what? Like, what's their problem? <laughs> but, you know, I think as people of faith, it's been really exciting to see how when you apply what actually has been known for 2000 years, that we should love people first and we should treat people with dignity and, and, and embed into things hope right. and thriving, that yes. that is actually uh, going to yield better results. And so that community from Wellington Valley moved almost as a whole to our first site at Elizabeth Street. And what we noticed is that that community building that was happening at Wellington Valley actually quite helped the Elizabeth Street site gel as a right. group there at Elizabeth Street. And so those folks have been there for now over six weeks, eight weeks. We're into eight weeks here. Eight weeks, yeah. And they are, some of them, securing housing. Some right. of them on their way to uh, having medical support that they've needed for many years some of them stabilizing uh, their mental health or their addictions activities in ways that they're just safer and, mm -hmm. and, and doing better with those things. So they're beginning to contemplate what a future can look like. Very exciting stuff. Yeah. We I, opened our, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say like, uh, we, we, we just, uh, we had Richard Beck on a while ago. This book is called Stranger God. And um, he, he talks about what you're exactly what you're saying. And, and I, I, the other one that came to mind is Marislav Wolf, who talks about flourishing, you know, he doesn't use the word thriving, but uh, thriving, but human flourishing and what does it look like? And, and what Beck gets at in his book is that, you know, it's, it's about that business of putting aside our, our triggers, our insecurities, our fears, all the things that we have to love people first. It's a very Jesus radically Jesus model, right? Um, and it's not something everybody gets. <laughs> and uh, the fact that we have a living, breathing example of it here in the city of London makes me very proud, I must say. Like, I, you know, I, I think a lot of cities get bogged down a lot of arguments about what needs to happen first and all this sort of moralism and everything. Um, and it shows itself in different ways. And in fact, I'll, I'll flip over to Ian because he has a question about this because that often manifests itself in places like, do we have to do this this way? Yeah, and like the interming house is incredible, right? The, it's it's so important to to note and to point out the fact that you're saving lives. Like this this is this is life saving to a lot of people. Um, but getting this off the ground required overcoming a lot of critics. Um, there was a lot of people with the mentality of "not in my backyard," which is very unhelpful. Um, Little nimby. Yeah, to say, to say the least. Um, what was your response to that sort of uh, mentality? And now that things are up and running, how how has that changed? And how have people changed that mentality? Is it still around? Is it is it um, still? Do people still have that um, mentality going forward? Go ahead, Sarah, on this one. You want me to take this one? Well, first of all, I think that it's really common for people to have this reaction of nimbyism because it is uncomfortable to see people in pain and desperation. It doesn't matter what's going on. Uh, if you are safe and secure at home, and we live here in North America with all the resources we have, and you see that this is the, the result, you know, that there are people living on these kinds of margins, it is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, well, who do we blame? Mm. And, and, and so that's, I think, the roots of nimbyism. So just to recognize our discomfort with the pain and suffering around us, again, when we take a Jesus approach to that, recognizing that we can be present in that pain, we don't have to turn away, we can actually be there uh, and, and, and sit beside folks who are going through difficulty. Uh, moreover, though, uh, our neighbors have been incredible. So there's like, the, you know, it's, it gets really publicized that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like those guys. And they find the one neighbor who's really grumpy about someone. Needles, needles, needles. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, when we were setting up at the Elizabeth street site, uh, someone came by with these folded paper cranes and said, that, could you put one on each pillow and let people mm. know that this is a sign of peace? You know, or mm. here's some baked cookies. I heard you were looking for baked goods or, God, you know, so um, I've been talking to my daughter about why this is important in our neighborhood. And, and, you know, thank you for this opportunity to share about how we can love and accept everyone in our community. 
that is a much lesser known story, but mm. certainly well represented story in our community. Um, and so that's what I kind of think about the NIMBYism. We're all uncomfortable with the pain and suffering and that this is the best we can do. And beyond that, there's an incredible capacity for compassion and love in our communities. And well, the, I think I understand your, your own story in it is, is really important as well. It, it's like a parent uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with your children is to remember that you were a child once. Um, and there, there is a, a, a place of all of us in ignorance of not knowing how to respond well to impoverished situations. And I, I can claim that on my, my for myself. I, I wasn't always the person that I am before. And it was the courage of people who are at street level and, and around the streets that taught me what I know today. It is not because I, I got a great education, although I do. It, it was because I, I listened to people. And so when I hear about NIMBY, the first thing I want to do is educate people and raise awareness. I don't, I, I realize for most people, there are going to be people who will be NIMBY no matter what, right. but for most people, it's an ignorance issue. It's a, it's an issue of not knowing it's an issue of societal and even in structural myths around poverty and, and people who are stuck in poverty around them, not working hard enough and stuff like that around them always just being addicts and all sorts of negative stereotypes that we throw around and not understanding what happened and how they got there. So raising awareness, getting to know people. What I loved about uh, some of the, the stuff that's come out of the wish is that um, two of the local news sources have done stories yeah. just on people that have, have are living there and, and sharing those stories breaks down more barriers than, than anything we could do as, as the rich teaching one another. Yeah. It's people saying, this is what happened to me. This is my story. This is, and this is how life is getting better because you guys took a chance on me. Yeah. And what I loved about Mayor Ed visiting uh, yeah. this past week was the people that I used to visit down in Wellington Valley were now rubbing shoulders with the mayor with of the London. Mayor. And there's so it. much fun about that. I would yeah. see mm -hmm. the, the two ferrets that were on in the paper this past week. I saw them down in Wellington Valley and I met them and I know them by name. Yeah. And here's Ed holding them now. And that, that yeah. to me was really mm. quite amazing. And, yeah. and what happens when you can share stories and, and raise awareness. And yeah, the other thing I wanna just stress is what, what Sarah emphasized as well, is the overwhelming support of this Amen. community. It has gone, it is unbelievable. Johnny and I are in charge of getting donations from people. And we actually had to put out a video that said, stop. Stop it. <laughs> we, were, we were just getting so much. We, we, had, we had too much. We had all of our storage facilities were over full. And so we were just, it's so exciting. I get phone calls and emails and texts uh, daily from people wanting to do fundraisers, people, all these little local businesses that are struggling themselves saying, I want to bring bagels. I want to bring pizzas. Pierogies was the one we got this morning. Ooh. It was just amazing stuff. Punchy's coming up. Just, yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful. So we, we're just excited by that. And it, it's, it, there's a few voices, yes, but uh, they've been drowned out by an overwhelming support by this community. Isn't that great to hear, Robbie? It's, like that's fantastic. That's great. No, it is. It's great to name that too. And uh, you know, it's that that mustard seed kind of faith that we talk about a lot. Those little things that you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the whole thing, obviously, because it is a big issue. But like as Sarah was mentioning, those little mustard seeds, those little uh, gifts on a pillow or a bag of bagels that people can actually feel like they're being part of of the healing of other people. That's huge for folks. So it's, it's good that we can name that and, and know that that's important. Um, so, you know, I think it's clear to those who follow you that uh, you both are talking about kind of a, a deconstruction um, of faith and, and, and a reconstruction of faith. And you advocate giving up kind of the um, evangelical hold on life and encourage folks to move toward a faith of, of love and anti-oppression and anti-imperialism which is uh, music to our ears and things that we've talked about here on the podcast. So I wonder if you could expand on this a little bit for us and, and where you're trying to go with that with, with folks. I guess for either well, I, of you. I will start because I'll be short. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I go to Gil for all my theological, like you, you use the big words, Gil, when it comes to this. I'll use the most simple of words here. Wow. <laughs> the, sim the simple words 
from, from my perspective are this, if we have to serve a God that is in a box mm -hmm. that can only be a certain way that mm -hmm. is, you know, um, out for judgment out for, you know, uh, something he needs from us. That's not, that's not the kind of God we serve. Mm -hmm. We serve a God who's already done it. He's done all the things that, that need to be done for people. And he loves us so much. I wore my shirt for you. See all these hearts? Hearts, beautiful. I, I, I try to remind people it is about love. God is love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when we, when we allow love to change us from the inside out, that is truly salvation. And that is what, that is what people are looking for. They're looking for that hope. They're looking to reconnect to that, to that source of love in their own lives. And, um, you know, having grown up in Pentecostal church, there's some, there's some hurtful things in the, in the theology of, of that evangelical, um, story. It's not all bad. I'd like to acknowledge that I had lots of great things in my upbringing, but there were some real hurtful things in that. And, and we mm. overcome those hurtful things by the very same power, that power of love. And if we stay focused on that, we can accomplish so much in terms of bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Like there's so much possibility. There's so much hope in that. And so that's kind of, there's the simple words that I have for it. Go. Those are, <laughs> I pass I it gonna, to the I'm going to interrupt and say, that's not simple. That's profound. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead, yeah, Pastor. Exactly. Go ahead, exactly. Pastor. <laughs> uh, my journey towards deconstruction happened. Uh, I became a Christian in my early twenties and, uh, um, I was I was brought up in another religion, and so one of my early attractions to Christianity was the the difference it was and the rightness of it. So it was the way. Uh, we, there was a lot of stress on that. It was the only way. And what it what it brought out in me was this ugly, which I can see now, but I didn't see then. This ugly need to be right. This ugly uh, wanting to to be on the side of of the one who wins all of the time. That's probably why I'm a Habs fan. Hey, um, but, <laughs> hey there you go. And and uh, I just like to say, like Sarah, I wore this shirt for you so that you can all feel loved. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> but what I had is a, a, a very triumphal view of, of what God was all about, that if you were on his side, he would be on your side. And no matter what mm. happened in your life, he would set it right. And you just need to pray right, believe right, and all sorts of things mm. like that. And uh, that was kind of the building of a, a house of cards of faith mm -hmm. that I had. Um, and I didn't know it was a house of cards until it came tumbling down right. uh, when my wife uh, developed postpartum depression after the birth of my second child. Yeah. And um, we tried everything. We tried all of the, the right responses. We tried praying right. We tried, we tried bringing in the elders from the church to, to pray over her and, and put uh, oil on her and, and say all the right things. And she never got better. Uh, she had what she called electricity flowing through her at night mm -hmm. and she couldn't sleep. And it was, it was terrible, but my faith wouldn't see the terrible. It, all I saw was Bonnie's lack of faith. Mm -hmm. And then one night at the lowest my, moment of our marriage, I accused her of that that she didn't have enough faith. Wow. And um, yeah, we've obviously worked through it and uh, chatted a lot about it. But I uh, got a phone call from a friend a few days later and he said, I heard what you said to Bonnie. And my, the next thing I expected him to say was, well done, you know, you did, you did <laughs> what you should. And uh, instead he said, um, I just want you to know that some things will not be healed on this side of eternity. Mm. and that broke me yeah. yeah that broke me and i have been broken ever since yeah um it was around that time i started doing a, i was doing a research paper on the weakness of jesus mm. my paper was actually called was jesus weak it was based mm. on second corinthians 12 mm. and the idea that jesus was crucified in weakness and what did mm. that mean and what does it mean now that we have a God who walks with us in our weakness? Or that John uses the word glory, meaning where heaven and earth literally overlap so much so when Jesus is being crucified. Mm. In other words, we see God most clearly when Jesus is most weak. 
And so that, that to me is a, a beautiful re, <laughs> reconstruction of faith around the idea of the weakness of, of us and the weakness of our God. Uh, who meets us in the middle of our weakness and it's it, that's where it started to get rebuilt and from there um, you just I started reading all sorts of great uh, people that would help me along the way Bishop Tom Wright was the the mm -hmm. first of it all uh, John Cross and uh, Brian Walsh a local guy um, and then his wife Sylvia Kazmat and then even a local theologian uh, Dan Outshorn who works uh in the city and does uh, did some amazing writing about empire and all sorts of things like that in Paul's writing. And, and all of this started to add up to a much better picture than I ever had with my triumphal Jesus, my evangelical Jesus. Right. And it's right. a Jesus who stands on the side of the oppressed. Right. It's a Jesus who is trying to overturn oppression with love instead of, as Paulo Freire would say, instead of uh, creating a new oppress oppressor um, narrative, it actually shifts the narrative into a love narrative. Yes. And that to me is really exciting stuff. Yeah. When yeah. we don't just have a, a, new, a new oppressor, that the oppressed are crushed so much that they rise up and they become the new oppressor, that in Jesus, that we, the oppressed rise up in love and in being rehumanized in love, rehumanize the oppress oppressor and then both sides are rehumanized mm -hmm. because it's not yeah. humanizing to to crush one another or to be crushed right and so it's so exciting then you find passages like isaiah where the the mountains come down and the valleys come up and you're like this is the dream yeah. and then jesus says it's not just a, enough that everybody has just enough he said i came that we would have life and life abundantly right so that feeds into how we respond to the impoverished right we're not just trying to get people to survive we're saying we want people to thrive we want we want them to flourish we want life abundantly for everybody and that's going to mean some of us are going to lose that's right we're going to have stuff taken away from us but that is how oppression ends and that's how we're all rehumanized yeah right yeah and it's not a top down it's a bottom up right yeah it's it comes from from that that place um I, go ahead kevin i knew you i was to. gonna say and a lot of solidarity right like so so right. to me the, the the good friday moment is an act of incredible solidarity you know solidarity with your wife right with you and your pain solidarity with uh with those uh, black indigenous persons of color who are on the margins solidarity with uh with those of us who grieve the loss of children you know on and on it goes uh, but it's not just a, a, this sort of sacrificial atonement that we all get jumped up on, but it's this incredible act of solidarity, which right. pushes us to, the, to, 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 which should push us anyway, towards that place. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. No, and, and your story, you know, Gil, thank you for sharing that because I know there's it's people It's incredibly listening. powerful. Yeah, very powerful. I know there's people listening to this podcast right now that are hearing themselves in that story. Um, different circumstances possibly in their lives, but they're hearing themselves. And I was, I was just finished. I was going to talk about um, another author that I really like is Brian McLaren. Um, and I just finished reading his book, which is called uh, Faith After Doubt. Um, it just came out a couple of months ago and he walks through what some of that deconstruction is for folks. And uh, I certainly would recommend that, but I was going to, there's another book. Um, he's coming up on our podcast actually to talk about this book in a little bit, but there's another one he wrote called we make the road by walking. And there's a, a little quote I wanted to share uh, with us and then have you guys talk about it. He writes this, he says, um, but before Christianity was a rich and powerful religion, before it was associated with buildings and budgets and crusades and colonial, colonialism and televangelism, it began as a revolutionary, nonviolent movement promoting a new kind of aliveness on the margins of society. A new kind of aliveness. And, you know, we mentioned a little bit about that, bringing life to those to those margins. So when you hear that, I mean, does that reflect with some of the stuff you're doing and, and working in and and how does that resonate with you, that idea? When I hear that, I hear, you know, a statement I often tell people, having been raised in in the Pentecostal church, I was saved from being saved. <laughs> uh, I like that. Because yeah. I grew up, you know, so much about this is what saved means and this is what it is. And and when I read that, you know, 
our faith, our Christianity, our version. For many years, I actually would not call myself a Christian. It was just not a word I could uh, relate to or call myself uh, because I didn't want to be associated with, with some of the structures that have existed in our Christian, North American Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're absolutely right that when we can be saved from that kind of Christianity and turn and actually see the God of love and peace and equality, equity, uh, the God that brings us together and, and sees each person as beloved, uh, Mm -hmm. we begin to live this life that, you know, for me is a dangerous wonder. We live on the edge with, with folks and we're willing to do the extra. And, and, you know, most recently I was talking to Every morning we have a, a conversation with the city of London about these wish pop-up shelters because they're just not sure that this is really safe. You know, every day they <laughs> want to know, uh, you know, how many things have gone wrong and what's happening there and whatever. Show and me the wounds, was, Jesus. Show me your wounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and today I was uh, sharing with them some of the wonderful things that have been happening. But more than that, that this community, this faith community, the, you know, particularly here at the Ark. Uh, it's great we've opened these 60 spots, but it's not enough in this frigid, cold temperatures. Gee, could we do uh, additionally and out of the cold from the arc? And so we we put that together over the weekend, and then we opened it up even more so by partnering with the YMCA, and we start tonight for six nights in a row of out of the cold ministry. And Fantastic. The, the yeah, the city fellow says to me, where do you get the energy? Like, aren't, haven't we killed you yet? <laughs> and, uh, and I thought to myself, this is very much like, this is very much a God thing that mm-hmm. he gives us the strength for the next thing that he provides the provision. Even yesterday I was contemplating like, what the heck am I doing? And how, you know, I need a good night's sleep. Ah, you know, mm. what's going on here. And, and I just was praying and I said, Lord, if you want this to happen, you've got to provide all the volunteers to make this go because I, I'm using all my best skills and I'm getting tired. And, you know, we put out that Facebook post last night. I don't know what time it was exactly about the out of the cold. And we are like 80% filled for volunteer spots this Mm. morning. Praise the Lord. And I thought, Lord, like, because, and it's because of that very quote that when, when our faith is not about the structures and it's just about the, the love, yeah. you know, it's amazing how people come together and, and it's amazing how the provision is there and that we don't need to be in a scarcity mentality that we actually live in the abundance yes. of yes. this great loving father. So right. anyhow, that, that's kind of how I read your, your quote today. That's how it hits me in the practical today. <laughs> Great. Yeah. What, what I love about the idea of uh, life starting on the margins is that that, that idea that you get, uh, if you read Mother Teresa, mm. they, they asked her, how do you get your energy? That's an <laughs> interesting thing, Sarah, you just brought up. How do you get your energy? Because uh, she would just go to bed exhausted every night and wake up similarly exhausted from what I understand, especially <laughs> near the end. And she said, I get to wake up every day and look in the eyes of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that, yeah. that, that Jesus is among the broken, that he is among the oppressed. When you do unto the least of these, you did unto me, Jesus right. said. Right. And so it, he is right there among them. And you say, okay, how can God be among those people? They don't have this. They don't have this. They don't have that. So obviously they don't have. So they can't possibly be Jesus. And what they have is something that most of us don't have, which is the truth. Yeah. They have a way of declaring truth to the rest of us that we cannot handle. And it's a very Jesus way of telling it. It's a very prophetic way of telling us the truth. They cannot hide their pain. They no. cannot hide their loss. They cannot hide anything that has gone wrong in their life. They wear it. They smell like it. They look like it. Yeah. And it's, it's a painful thing for them to live out that existence because it's right there all the time. The rest of us, the middle to upper class, have hidden it so well. Yes. We were all crushed in some way uh, in our upbringing, and 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 we got to. No, you're kidding. We me. say Look. that that in the in the hallways we say, "How are you doing?" and we all say, "Good." That's right. And we never yeah. say what's actually I'm, going on in our yeah. life. I'm and great. I'm busy. Happened. I'm busy. I'm busy. 
Yeah, and we keep busy, which is a nice imperial thing of, of saying. Um, yeah. But the idea of truth. So finally, when I get to be among my friends who are at the, on the streets, I can finally be truthful with myself. Right. I can start looking in and saying my own pain, my own losses, my own ways I'm not the way I should be. And when you start admitting all those things, guess what you need is a savior. Yeah. And you start saying, I'm, I'm actually the broken mess of the person that I am. Right. Right. And I'm also right. caught in this big old narrative yeah. that is trying to progress us all towards crushing one another and, and ignoring the problems of the world. And mm. again, prophetically, the crushed ones rise up and say, no, right. this is this something better in the world. And yes. we can make a difference in that if we listen to the prophets, if we listen to Jesus right in the homeless. I love it. There's a great book called uh, Embracing Hopelessness by uh, Miguel uh, de la Torre. Um, and it's exactly, I mean, it's ba basically, you just paraphrase his book, Bill. It's this notion that uh, he says that those of us who have been the benef beneficiaries of uh, white privilege uh, primarily have no idea. Like we want to, we want to keep talking about hope because it makes us feel better. And, and his whole thing is that, you know, it's not ever served those on the margins because when you bring a busload of people to uh, a church in Oak Ridge, everybody gets uncomfortable, right? <laughs> like it's never, it's okay to talk about it in theory. His thing is when you enter into a lived experience and you get in relationship with people and you're prepared to sit in their hopelessness, in their brokenness, in their pain, without turning away, <laughs> without having to sort of say, oh, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just, you know, and it's why I like a lot of what you're doing. I mean, when you talk about uh, Sarah and, and, and Gil, both of you, but Sarah, when you were talking about that idea of flourishing or thriving or asking folks who are suffering, what will it mean for you? What do you need? Right. You know, that's an entirely different matter than prescribing some colonial attitude of how we're going to make people's lives more hopeful. Perhaps, you know, I mean, uh, uh, on a micro level, the story you told about your wife, Gil, I mean, what she needed was not somebody to tell her how to fix it. She needed someone to sit with her in it. Right. I mean, it's 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 the, it's the way of our journeys. Um, it's tough work, though. It's hard. Um, OK, so we're on uh, just to transition a little bit, because uh, I know we can't we could talk all day, but you guys would probably get tired of us after a while. Um, but uh we're, we, one of the things we've been doing throughout February is highlighting Black History Month. Um, and so a couple of questions on that before we, we let you go today. First off, uh, one of the things, and you alluded to this earlier, Gil, one of the things that COVID has done is it's exposed something which has always been there, or at least it's pulled back the veil. I don't know if it's exposed it. It's been there, but the veil has been pulled back. We had Nadia Bowles Weber um, on, and she talked about this as, a, uh, as an apocalyptic time in that it, things were being revealed. And for those of us who have lived in privilege, uh, many of us are having our eyes open to things uh, that have been a, a reality in people's lived experiences for a long, long time. I just this morning saw a piece in the London Free Press about uh, the young man in Stratford, a uh, young autistic indigenous uh, uh, young man who was uh, badly beaten by police and now the police have been cleared of all charges in that. It's another example of yet another person of, of, of uh, of color, an indigenous person who is clearly not getting the same treatment as somebody else. If I'm walking on the railway tracks, they're asking me to get off the railway tracks. They're not chasing me down and driving me into the railway tracks and punching me in the head. That's just my white privilege. So I guess as, a, as, as it is Black History Month, I'm thinking about um, the things that are revealed. And you guys are down there um, and you, you've been quite involved on the street level, both of you. In, in different ways over the years. Um, we see systemic racism in our penal system, in our, our uh, law enforcement, in, in uh, medical system, in education, and yes, even in the church. Um, it's all right there in front of us, and now we're becoming more aware of it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Black, Indigenous, and persons of color are dis disproportionately affected uh, by things like homelessness and by things like COVID? And by, you know, so many other things. I just wonder if you can share some of, of your lived experience on, on this Black History Month. So for me, it's, it's, uh, it's been a learning curve as well, um, getting here. Uh, we first saw the, the unfair treatment just even in all of our folks who are, are homeless and street involved. Uh, it mm -hmm. starts there and to understand that it's, 
it's among a lot of our folks and then it's emphasized in, in, in black indigenous uh, folks in our community as well. Uh, I remember one evening um, I, I sat down with one of my friends who is an indigenous man and uh, that to me is, is, is uh, you know, just a breakthrough in itself is that somebody who's, who's indigenous would, would be able to trust a white dude mm -hmm. who represents a church uh, enough to share a little bit about their life um, says what what relationship and love can do um, and that's that's all that person that's not me at all and that's per that's the person having to come and accept me as an ally and they've done the work there I just did the offer and they did the work of of coming and towards me so he started telling me some of the stories of, of his interactions that he's had in the downtown core uh, with people um, in law enforcement and, and other places and it, my eyes just kept opening bigger and bigger and what happened was uh, because he was telling uh, his stories a, 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 a few other friends of ours who are also indigenous sat around and by the end of it there was eight to ten uh, different friends of mine who are indigenous just kind of telling their different stories of their interactions in the downtown core and by the end of it you I was it was soul crushing yeah to realize what is actually going on out there that I had never experienced. Mm -hmm. One guy talked about um, just going across the street uh, right beside a, a gentleman who, who was uh, Caucasian. And as he was walking across the street, a cop came up behind him and put his hand on his shoulder. And he assumed it was just to say, come on, let's hurry along and it was to pull him aside and to talk to him specifically about what he was doing and my friend just kept saying but i was right beside that guy why aren't yeah. you talking to that guy he's right there what's yeah. wrong yeah. Yeah. and it was so painful to hear and the stories like that that just keep adding up and we can we can deny it all we want to but it's a reality and our folks are hurting from it and it's it's not right and things have to change yeah I, I kind of, I approached this um, from a little bit of a slightly different vantage point uh, as a mother of biracial children. Uh. Um, so my own awareness of racism, systemic racism, individual, how we each carry that, yeah. uh, recognizing racism in myself yeah. uh, while raising my kids has been uh, an incredibly painful uh mm. experience and it has given me some insight to the experience of our of our homeless like you add to that the homeless and and the traumas that people have experienced that bring them to homelessness um for my own children here in the city of london uh we have not one of my four kids has gone through their school experience without being called the n-word wow at some point in their schooling not one of my kids has gone through uh, the school system at this point without being considered stupid. Mm. Uh, that that's kind of an, that is a assumption made about them. I have mm. one son who's uh, considered gifted. Uh, mm. And and uh, one of his friends says, you're, you're really like more white than black, right? And, <sighs> you know, and kind of wow. how that lives inside of a kid. God. So- you know, for us to think that we're kind of post racism or that we, we middle-class educated folks, we've got this figured out. We don't, oh, yeah. um, me, the woman who married a black man who I love and made children that I love still carries certain assumptions. I can remember in my dating, uh, life with my husband saying like, you know, don't assume that the guy who's interviewing you for that job isn't going to want you because you're black. Well, I've, I had no idea, but that that had been his experience every job he had ever had. Right. You know, I am like they they pick up on your assumption. No, yeah. that's actually an assumption yeah. that exists in the world. That's right. So I I come to my understanding of what folks are going through, uh, people, black people, indigenous people, people of color, from this lens of a mom. To be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, a mom who's on the outside in my house, I'm the minority. I'm the only white person <laughs> in, in yeah. my home. And, and my kids like to let me know that. Good for them. <laughs> oh yeah. They like to let me know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, and and they'll use some of those uh, those things that we kind of yeah expect about white people. And anyway, it's it's a funny thing around the dinner table sometimes. But uh, what I what I see when I translate this experience to our folks who are living marginalized and on the street and have the added struggles of not being raised by their families, right. not having a sense of identity, those early attachment issues, mm -hmm. the folks who are raised by uh, parents who had grown up in the residential school system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, this experience uh, that has led to the traumas in their lives, exacerbated by homelessness, means here in the city of London and on our wish sites that there's 20% of the homeless population that we know of in the city of London identifies as indigenous. And right. yet in the city of London, we have an 8% yeah. indigenous population. Right. You know, we're overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think about this often when we're working with people that, that the BIPOC population has no reason to trust the systems. Mm -hmm that we think we're setting up for them, again, it's back to listening yeah. and asking, mm -hmm. what will it take? How do we adjust? It's yeah. our job to do the adjusting and the changing and the listening. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, we need to continuously be asking those questions. And, and that is also exhausting for people to right. be asked sure. constantly. Over what and they over. Yeah. 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 So, so we need to listen carefully. We need to learn from our past. We need to change our opinions we've really got to do some, some hard work. So I really appreciate your question. Yeah. And, and just finally, guys, before we wrap up, continue with Black History Month, uh, we're just asking all our guests this year, um, if you're comfortable to share one of your uh, Black heroes or influencers, who do you think of and give thanks for this Black History Month, if anyone comes to mind? I got two. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, there's, you're allowed, related. you're, you're allowed to have two, uh, allowed is, is, to have two you're least. allowed to have two. All right. Uh, the, the first one would obviously be Bishop Desmond Tutu. Mm -hmm. Um, his, his book, no future without forgiveness, uh, is one of those ones that you read through and you say, this can work yeah. at, at a, a structural level, as a societal level. This whole Jesus thing is not a nice pie in the sky when you die thing. It's mm -hmm. actually very applicable and structurally and society changing. Now, it, it hasn't worked out perfectly, obviously, in, in South Africa since then, um, but there was some amazing things that happened through that. Mm -hmm. And then it was the second one would be a person that uh, came to London a few years ago. Her name is Immaculate Illa Bagitsa. Uh, she is a um, survivor of Rwanda, wrote oh. the book uh, Left to Tell. And her story of of what it meant to go through the genocide and then come out the other side forgiving the people that murdered her family mm. uh, she left a, a a quote at the end that silenced the room of 200 of us who after she described the murder of her parents and her siblings uh, described the reconciliation of the one who did it um, meeting him in prison and forgiving him and loving him and finding ways to find reconciliation in that. And then she left us all with, if I did it, you must. Wow. Right. wow. And there's no, not one of us have a thread of anything to hold on to after her story. Wow. We, sure. you know, whatever sure. we thought we went through, <laughs> yeah. she tops it all. And, oh, yeah. and yeah, yeah, if, 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 whatever we went through, all of a sudden forgiveness starts to be the pathway forward. And it was a beautiful story. And, and I've, I've read most of what she has written since then because of how impactful it was to meet her and just her grace in the room. Um, I, I don't know if you've met people like that, but when you, mm. certain people walk in the room, you can feel a different presence, which you can only mm. label as grace or love. And yeah, yeah, she strikes me as, as one of my favorites. Good, thank you. Sarah, what about you? Any names come to mind? Probably won't surprise you that my heroes are my kids. Yes. Uh, watching them navigate the world around them and learning the, their perspective, the ways that they challenge stereotypes and um, 
you know, do it with such grace, a sense of humor and uh, continuously teach me uh, to keep my eyes open and, mm. and ask lots of questions. So, you know, my kids are my heroes um, in, in this regard. And then the friends and the, the people of color in my life that have taught me a, a little bit more about that experience so I can be sensitive. Um, here in the mm. city of London, we also have some incredible uh, people of color, Indigenous folks who are speaking um, loudly and clearly about what's going on in our community. Uh, Atlosa is an organization here in the city mm -hmm. that um, is not a, a part of WISH at this time, but they certainly um, did an incredible job uh, at the National Housing Days talking about what sheltering for Indigenous people looks like. And that has always shaped my view of what needs to happen next and how can we be part of that? So they're speaking loudly and clearly about that connection to land and, and, and the ways that we need to look to the land for some of the answers. We've got Ariel Kayabaga, who's mm. on city council and th there's a strong woman of color. Just, I always point to her for yeah, my kids and say, that's what we can do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Friend uh, of the podcast. <laughs> and you know, she, she is actively using her, her stage and her platform to uh, challenge what, what the norms are and, and to talk about the experience of, of BIPOC folks and how within our systems we need to make change. Um, she also did a fundraiser, by the way, for WISH, mm -hmm. which, you know, showing that extra she support. Uh, there's a woman named Suze Morrison. She actually was a Londoner at one point. She now uh, is uh, part of the NDP opposition at Queen's Park. Uh, she's an Indigenous woman and who shared a lot about her experiences with me, allowed me to ask tons of questions about her uh, years growing up, uh, living homeless at certain times in her life, uh, her family experience and what community looks like. Uh, a strong Indigenous voice talking about very important uh, solutions around uh, what we can do. So when I think about Black History Month, I think about about these women, these people who are who are making waves right now. Of course, in, in the history, I grew up with a dad who always loved to quote Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'd have to talk about him. And uh, mm -hmm. I grew up as a bookworm reading all the Maya Angelou mm -hmm. uh, literature. And uh, you know, these are these are some of the early forming concepts that came from these powerful people. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you so much. And um, you know, this, this brings our time to an end today. I got to tell you, we've done a lot of these podcasts. We've done a lot where we've learned so much and we have today, but I was thinking as we were talking, this has been one of those rare podcasts where I've not only learned, I've been moved. Yeah. Like the spirit was, was, was moving as we were talking. And I know as our listeners yeah. will watch this, it'll move amongst them and, and such powerful uh, witness you guys are to, and, and we know, you know, being out there, like we always say, you know, God's at work in our community. And to be able to go out and meet God where God is already working and, and do the things to bring about the kingdom. Um, it's, it's holy work and sacred work. And we thank you for sharing it, doing it and sharing your experiences with us. I know it's going to transform um, a lot of our listeners views of things as well. So thank you both for, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Amen. To that. The opportunity you guys. And if that you was an that. honor, thanks a lot. And again, thanks to Gil and to Sarah for, for their time today. Uh, quite a transformative podcast. That was fantastic. And uh, we remind our listeners to, to send this one to all the friends you got on your list, because Please. this is stuff that we really need to hear. Um, and if you want to find out more, I know uh, Gil's website, Sanctuary is available, Sanctuary Church, available for you to find, and Arcade Mission as well. They've got a website, and, and they're both on social media. So folks, if you want to find out more about what they're doing, and find out how you can participate. Um, maybe from your parish or from your community group or whatever it may be, please do that. So that wraps it up, guys. Uh, again, another great podcast. And uh, again, thanks to our sponsors for, for being part of what we do every week. First, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Deadly. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Yeah, uh, locally owned, locally operated. Go out and get your drugs from Carol. And to Molly Maid, to make your home a healthy haven, and call Molly Maid today. And thanks to Tricia for all her support as well. So, guys, good to see you. You too, guys. This uh, a, day like, a day like today lifts my spirit. It does. It you know, does. we started the podcast by saying, you know, we're all tired. 
of COVID and its restrictions and all that stuff. But to hear Sarah and Gil talk about what they're doing, they don't seem very restricted at all. They're out there yeah. getting the work done and, yeah. uh, and really uh, making a difference. And I think we can, we can all take some heart in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Okay, guys, have a great week. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Church. Kevin George, St. Aidan's Anglican Church. And my name is Ian. <laughs> and remember, Kevin, to always look both ways, buddy. This way and then this way. Oh, before you cross the street. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!